Why do we get upset and angry about things that we later realize weren't worth that energy? This best-selling book explains exactly how our minds sabotage us and better still, how we can manage our minds to live a more fulfilling and happy life. This guy even credits the book for helping him win his Olympic goals. I'll save you time by explaining it in three parts. By the end, you'll know exactly how to overcome your destructive mind. Starting with part one. The author Steve Peters is an expert psychiatrist who's worked with many top level athletes teaching them how to manage their minds for peak performance. To do this he uses a really simple model that once you know you can unsee. He explains that inside our brains we all have two minds that can think and act independently of each other. There is a human which is us and a chimp. The human part of our brain thinks rationally, wants to live well among others, and strives for a deep sense of purpose. The chimp, however, is the primal part of us, and its main goal is to keep us alive and continue the species. As a result, it is often very emotional, very irrational, but very demanding. The problem is, the chimp and the human are often in conflict with each other, wanting completely different things. Worse still, chimps are five times stronger than humans, which makes them super difficult to win against. Peter states that one of the biggest factors for our own success and happiness is learning to recognise when the chimp is in charge, not the human, and manage it effectively. To show the different modes of thinking, let's imagine Todd and his girlfriend Lisa are at a friend's party. During the evening, Todd notices Lisa laughing and chatting with an old school friend, Jake. Todd's human brain is observing calmly, thinking, there's nothing to worry about, I trust her completely. But then, Lisa touches Jake's arm in a friendly way, and Todd's chimp immediately wakes up. She's flirting with him, she's going to leave us for someone else. Now, Todd's body starts responding to the chimp. His heart races, his palms get sweaty, knees weak, mom's spaghetti on a sweater already. Lisa comes over, still in a good mood. She says, hey, I was just catching up with Jake, his new job sounds amazing. At this point, Todd's human mind thinks, she's just being social, no big deal. But the chimp is taking full control now and what Todd actually says is, oh, catching up, looked like more than that to me. Why were you all over him? Lisa is taken aback. What? I wasn't all over him, we were just talking. Todd's chimp, fueled by jealousy, keeps escalating. I saw how you were acting with him. Admit it, you were flirting. The argument spirals from here until the conversation is in full meltdown. Hours later, Todd sits alone and his human mind finally reasserts itself. I totally overreacted. I wish I'd stayed calm and trusted her like I know I should have. This shows how the chimp can easily turn a harmless situation into a big load of regret. Everyone's chimp is different. Some will get easily anxious, others angry, upset, and so on. There's nothing we can do about this, so we have to learn to accept the chimp we were given. Peters makes it clear that we're all responsible for managing our own chimps. If you had a dog and it bit someone, you couldn't just say, well, the dog did it, not me. It's your responsibility to make sure the dog doesn't bite people and your responsibility to manage your own chimp. The most important thing for dealing with your chimp is actually recognizing when it's in charge. If you were to write a list of everything you wish you were, honest, calm, hardworking, personable, etc. Then everything you write down is who you truly are. So here's the golden rule. Whenever you have feelings, thoughts, or behaviors that you don't want, then it is the chimp hijacking you. Once you recognize that they don't belong to you, then you, the human, can work on managing the chimp to get rid of them. So here are two really big indicators that a chimp is in control. First off is asking what if questions, such as what if I make a mistake? Or what if they don't like me? etc. Or the chimp saying, but I feel or don't feel, such as, but I feel like I'm not good enough, or but I don't feel like getting out of bed. So how do we actually manage the chimp? First off, it's important to generally look after the chimp as that will make it less likely to cause trouble. Try to recognize any primal drives that the chimp has and then find ways to satisfy them that are acceptable in the society that we live in. For example, if your chimp has competitive drives, then taking up a sport will be great for both you and the chimp. Since everyone's chimp is different, what works for one person may not work for someone else and there are no right or wrong answers. You also need to ensure that your chimp feels that it's in the right part of the jungle. Examples of being in the wrong jungle are living in a toxic home, having a toxic job, spending time with toxic people, etc. However, sometimes the chimp causes trouble anyway. So Peters explains three extremely helpful ways to manage the chimp. Exercise it, box it, and feed it bananas. The first is to exercise the chimp. If your chimp is upset or annoyed by something, then it first needs to release this emotion. Do this by saying exactly what you think, no matter how irrational it may be. This will calm the chimp down so that it is able to listen to reason or just go to sleep. The human will then take the sensible things that have been said and ignore the rest. But sometimes the chimp doesn't need to be exercised and you can calm it down easily, so don't unnecessarily provoke it. If the chimp no longer needs to exercise, you can then work on boxing it. This is where you, the human, use facts, truth, and logic to calm the chimp down and reason with it. For example, let's imagine a man, Andy, needs to go to the dentist for a filling 
and he's feeling extremely anxious about it. He knows this is silly, it's only the dentist, but this isn't helping. First, Andy needs to recognise it's the chimp that is worrying and not him. He knows it's a chimp because he answers the question, do I want these anxious feelings, with a simple no. Andy's human wants to be calm, since it's only a filling. Clearly, there's a battle going on in Andy's head. So, for the human to get what it wants, it needs to follow the steps in the correct order. First, Andy has to allow the chimp to exercise. The chimp says, I am so stupid and this is pathetic. I know I'm going to make a fool of myself. Why did I have to get a cavity in my tooth? Why do we need to have teeth anyway? Can't we have something stronger? The rambling gets more and more stupid, but less and less powerful. After about 10 minutes, he stops and we hear the human saying, I've had enough of this moaning. The chimp is getting tired, if not exhausted. You have to remember the rambling was very important for getting the chimp tired. If you suppress the rambling then it is less likely you will be able to talk to the chimp, so don't hold back. Now Andy can start to box the chimp by talking to it using truth and logic. He might say to the chimp, if you really don't want to go then we won't go. We can just stay with a hole in the tooth and deal with the inevitable problems from this. If we do go, it may be painful to a certain extent, I agree with you. Sometimes it's good to agree with a chimp if it is telling the truth. Positive thinking is pointless if it's just ignoring the truth. Reality thinking is much better. The human continues. If we go and get the tooth fixed, then it will all be over in about 30 minutes and the benefits will be great. After it is over, we will be happy again. The treatment and discomfort won't last forever. Let's get some perspective on this. We are getting our tooth fixed. It's not the end of the world. I actually want this done. There are many truths you can tell the chimp, but the important part is that they are significant to your chimp specifically. If you repeatedly do this, you will train the chimp to realise that you are in charge and there are rules it must live by. At first, the chimp may refuse to cooperate and it may take several repeat episodes of exercising the chimp for any one problem before you can box it. You may also need to keep putting the chimp back into its box several times for any one problem. But with practice and skill, the chimp will respond and finally the human can manage the situation. We never control the chimp, we manage it. Chimps are also irrational, so don't always try to understand its emotions, just deal with them. The third way is to feed the chimp bananas, which means giving the chimp things it wants as either distractions or rewards. This method isn't great for solving problems in the long run, but in certain circumstances, it can be a very effective way to manage a chimp. For example, they're great for getting things done in the short term or distracting yourself from worries. So let's say you struggle to get out of bed in the morning. To distract your chimp, you can make a rule that every time your alarm goes off, you count down from five, and before you finish, you must be out of bed. By doing this you don't give your chimp any time to interfere with negative feelings and thoughts that will make you not want to get up. So that's an example of a distraction banana. A reward banana is more obvious. If you have 15 emails that you need to send and your chimp really doesn't want to do it and you would rather have a coffee instead then you simply tell your chimp that once you have sent five emails you can treat yourself to a coffee. You should be really careful using food as rewards and remember there are other primitive drives that you could use instead. For example chimps love praise and approval from others so if you really need to paint your bedroom wall but you don't want to then and call a friend up and invite them around to see your new room when it's finished. The chimp will then be super motivated to do it as they'll be excited to get praise and they won't want to look bad if they haven't done it. Feelings are very important to chimps but they often forget that feelings come and go. Sometimes the human has to say, I don't care how you feel, we have to do this. Humans care more about how they feel at the end of the day with how they spent it. Also, people often don't realise that a chimp is just making an offer not a command. You have a choice in whether you obey it or not. When you're tired, your chimp takes control, which is why we become irritable, make silly mistakes and rash decisions, and have mood swings, etc. We all know this, but still neglect our sleep. So make sure you get the rest that you need and look after your body. The chimp also takes control in the night, so any thoughts and feelings you may have are often very disturbing, catastrophic, and lacking in perspective. So try to develop the automatic behavior of not engaging with thoughts seriously until the daytime when your human is in charge. You, as the human, must accept that there are many people in the world that don't care for managing their chimps and you need to learn to accommodate this into your life. There's a big problem. The human and the chimp aren't the only parts that make up the brain. There is also a final part, the computer. The computer, like the chimp and the human, can also think and act automatically for us. The computer stores different thoughts, beliefs, values, and behaviors, which have over time been put in there by either the chimp or the human. Many things that are stored in the computer are really helpful and help us to live calm and simple lives. However, the big problem comes from when the chimp has programmed in some very nasty thoughts and behaviors. In the book, Peters calls these gremlins. A gremlin is an unhelpful or destructive belief or behaviour that with effort can be removed. They have a massive effect on many people's lives and often wreak havoc on our emotional states. Some example gremlins could be overreacting to situations, eating every time you feel like it but don't need to, beating yourself up, etc. Gremlins are often very well hidden so you first need to find them. For example, it may not be obvious to you that you have a hidden belief that you are not as good as others so you need to find it. You can usually find hidden gremlins by reflecting on when you've had a negative emotion, anger, upset, disappointment, etc. And ask yourself, what happened? 
What were you and others doing? And most importantly, what were you thinking? If they were causing negative emotion, it is likely to be a gremlin that can be removed. So how do we remove a gremlin? Once you have found an unhelpful belief, the next step is to replace it with a helpful belief. So to replace the belief, I am not as good as others, you could replace it with, all humans are equal and we are all worthy of respect. It's important that the answers you give the gremlin ring true for you, otherwise they won't work. Don't try to fool yourself into believing something that you don't. You then need to think about the new belief regularly, rehearsing it until it becomes your automatic response. This can take several weeks or months before the the gremlin is removed but doing this will put the belief into the computer which is 20 times faster than the chimp and it will stop it reacting constantly reassuring the chimp is effective but it's emotionally exhausting so using the computer is much better a really popular gremlin is the should could gremlin many times we will say i should be better at this or i should do this a lot of the time this brings a lot of guilt and shame and we beat ourselves up beating yourself up is a painful waste of time instead often you can replace should with could I could be better at this, or I could do this. Gremlins also have a nasty habit of returning, so watch out for them. You need to be vigilant and try to address them every time you recognise them. However, gremlins get worse than this. Often they work together and there are multiple unhelpful beliefs making things worse. These are very difficult to sort out in your head, so it's best to write down your thinking and all the unhelpful beliefs on paper. That way you can remove each one individually. So this is the ultimate takeaway. The more time you spend reflecting on how your mind is operating, the more likely it is you will begin to feel happier and live life being the person you truly want to be. Feelings come and go, not everything you think is helpful and not everything you believe is really true. You have a choice whether you want to listen to your chimp or not.